Hello, everyone. My name is Lital Kipperman Buckning, and I'm the head of innovation and strategic partnerships at the Paris Center for Peace and Innovation. Welcome to our session today at this amazing stage, which we will discuss, discuss about reinventing the startup nation, what you need to know about Israel's next decade. In the last decade, Israel has become a world leader in innovation and more. But what's next? In this session, you will hear the views of top corporate executives, academia, and government leaders providing valuable insight into the future of innovation and investment in the fastest growing tech ecosystem in the world. Shimon Peres was always a true believer in the future, in the belief that tomorrow can always be made better than today. So before we move on to our great speakers, I would like to share with you the vision of the Paris Center for Peace and Innovation and the work we are doing to, uh, <coughs> sorry, to make sure the State of Israel will remain a leader of innovation. When Shimon Peres was president, Barack Obama came for a visit and wanted to see in his eyes the startup nation, but there was no real physical place that they could take him to. So an ad hoc exhibition was built for him. So when Shimon Peres finished his presidency, he wanted to give the, the State of Israel one last gift, a physical place in which everyone who desires to see in their own eyes the story of the startup nation will have a place to go to and to get inspired about Israel and its innovation story. He wanted it to be a place of dreams, a place founded on the desire to leave the next generation with a better and brighter future. His vision, his vision came to life this year when we opened the Innovation Visitor Center a space for visitors from all ages, children from the periphery of society, as well as esteemed delegations, may understand how and why the startup nation came to be, take a look at the past and current revolutionizing innovations, and understand that all the challenges of the future in every aspect of society are actually potential opportunities for all of us to create, innovate, and improve our shared future. The Visitor Center takes you through a guided tour of, our, of an hour and a half throughout the story of the innovation nation, the past, present, and future. It includes an introduction to top 18 innovators in Israel, a unique history line telling the story of the most remarkable inventions throughout Israel's history, and jump to the future in our time capsule you saw in the previous slide. It's a unique VR experience showcasing how technology can assist us overcome challenges that the future will bring with it. And lastly, a remarkable exhibition of top 45 startups in Israel today in different verticals, which, by the way, we just now opened the call for entries to the second cohort of the innovation gallery. So if there are entrepreneurs, investors in the crowd that think their startup has what it takes, I urge you to apply. We will be happy to see you with us. The Visitor Center opened its gates a year ago, and we can proudly say it became, the gateway, it became the gateway for Israeli innovation. In the past year, we had 75,000 visitors, including leaders of states, the government, military representatives, top executives from international companies, MBA grads from top universities worldwide, and the wide audience of, in Israel. But the Visitor Center is just the beginning the platform on which the 360 degrees of innovation is built upon. We are building comprehensive educational and leadership components such as workshops, courses, lectures for different audiences, including innovation workshops for high-profile business de delegations. That is alongside educational tools for pupils and students in order to provide them with entrepreneurial instruments. We are focusing on shaping a more diverse, inclusive, and, th and thriving innovation ecosystem. One example is the Starting Up Together program, a pre-accelerator for people who are not your usual suspects to become entrepreneurs. It's 50% female, 50% men, 50% Arabs, 50% Jews from the entire Israel, including the periphery, learning the tools of how to become entrepreneurs. Another example is the accelerator in Ramallah, giving our Palestinian neighbors the tools to grow their ventures. We are putting a great effort on empowering the Israeli startup ecosystem through connecting to local, regional, and international partners. We are constantly bridging between the Israeli ecosystem and the leaders of innovation of the world, including the Innovation Summit who brought to Israel Jack Ma from Alibaba, Eric Schmidt, Google legendary chairman, Mark Benayev, the, CS, the CEO of Salesforce, and that's just one example. 
In the coming decade, we believe Israel will evolve to become the value nation, taking great stride in combining social and ecological responsibility into its tech, following the UN SDGs guidelines. Everything from R&D to business development and investments will be measured by the impact we have on our world. The Paris Center for Peace and Innovation is aiming to become a major catalyst for using innovation to better our world and our lives. In the coming decade, we will aim at inspiring young people to use innovation as a tool for positive change and helping startups and entrepreneurs use their power to create a better world. Innovation, peace and tikkun olam are all different sides of the same coin which we will use to invest in, in a better future for all. The Paris Center for Peace and Innovation will continue to bridge between the world and the Israeli ecosystem and to provide not only the inspiration required to innovate, but also to teach and encourage the use of Israeli innovation tool, tools and methodologies in order to make sure no one is left behind in this new, exciting world. Thank you. So, as I told you, for this session, we brought amazing speakers to help us present their unique angle, point of view on this topic. So I would like to present them now. So we have, sorry, Sagid Agan, Head of Growth Division in Israel Innovation Authority, our great partners at the Israel Innovation Center, and also our partners to the call for entry to the Innovation Gallery. So again, Sagid, thank you for being here. He will present the governmental angle. Bella Abrams, Director, Government Communication Society at Intel Israel and Europe. Again, our great partners at the Israel Innovation Center. And she will present the multinational angle. Professor Daphna Kariv, International Expert in Entrepreneurship and Innovation, will present the academia angle. Thank you for being with us today. And in Bala Rieli, author, serial entrepreneur and tech influencer, Co-CEO Synthesis will, uh, will present the sociological angle. Thank you, Inbal, for being here. So, I would like to ask now Sagit to come to the stage and present his view on the topic. Thank you. Click okay. open. Okay. Um, so after 50 years of innovation and innovation policy, what's next? So the story of uh, innovation policy in Israel starts about 50 years ago. Uh, we were a very different state 50 years ago. Uh, if you look on how many people worked in the industrial sector with academic degrees, then it was 1,000 people. So there was basically no R&D in the private sector. If you look on how much R&D was in the entire economy, less than 1%. Uh, today, I'll show you numbers. Uh, you'll be amazed. And then came government policies. In the early 1970s, the, uh, the Office of the Chief Scientist was formed in the Ministry of Economy, and it changed the entire policy from developing within government uh, institutions to developing products and technologies within the industry and moved all the money to support the industry uh, and to create also international collaboration and international financing of those uh, companies and projects. Uh, maybe some of you don't know, but in the same time, the Israeli defense uh, budget was actually in invent investing a lot of effort and a lot of money in creating technologies in information, communication technologies, sensors, electronics, which until today, more than 50 years later, are the core of the, of the deep technologies of the high-tech sector. And then 25 years later, uh, the R&D levels in the Israeli uh, economy was 2.5%, which is today's the, the global average of the entire OECD. Uh, we had an industry, but it wasn't enough. So we pushed on with more government policies more innovative, more aggressive, uh, more focus on entrepreneurial finance, putting money in startups, creating a VC industry. So again, the private sector could lead and aim the, the resources to the business potential. As you can see, during the 1990s, uh, the amount of R&D conducted in Israel jumped to more than 4%. And the entrepreneurial spirit just came out and 
and we became what is called, or was uh, called in the famous book, the startup nation. If you look today, then in the, in the numbers of 2019, those are the ones of 2018, uh, about 4.5% R&D expenditure in the Israeli GDP. If you add to that the, in the, the defense industries, in 2019, it's almost 5%. Highest in the world, double than the OECD average. What is even more interesting about that is that 85% of those expenditure are coming from the business sector. We are ranked number one also in this indicator. Uh, US is at 70%. So again, the private sector is leading the Israeli high-tech sector. Uh, the Innovation Authority, uh, we're responsible for the government support to industrial uh, R&D and, and, and private innovation. We are both keeping the ecosystem uh, 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 alive and keeping it very trendy and pushing all the startups, building also the infrastructure for the next tech waves and creating more growth within the, uh, uh, the high-tech sector. Again, we are not choosing where to invest. Companies from all fields are coming, and that's the, the key of the industrial policy in Israel. We are neutral. So we focus on market failures, and we focus on the next tech waves. But our main challenge, and now we're talking what will happen in the next decade, our main challenge is to see how we move from R&D moving to economic impact. And that's what we call the scale-up phase. Uh, lucky for us, and also for you, uh, that we are taking advantage of the future because the global economy is changing. The global economy is becoming digital. Uh, it means that there are no more geographical markets as, as they used to be. Israel is not, is not any more a, a remote island in the Middle East. Now, on the internet, Tel Aviv, Buenos Aires, Jerusalem, Helsinki, New York, they're all in the same place at the same time. So we are actually getting a lot of advantage uh, for the coming decade. Uh, so what will happen in the next decade? Uh, fortunately for us, the, the entrepreneurial spirit in Israel is very strong and the capabilities of the entrepreneurs uh, to bet uh, and to find the new tech waves and new markets and create new startups in new fields uh, are, are really you know, going to places where many other places in the world are just jealousing. So if you're looking on you know, food tech, in Israel we have an increase in food tech, agrotech. You see this, the VC, the venture capital industry, investing in them. It's something very untrivial. In, not in many other places in the world you see that. So for the next decade, you will still see amazing startups uh, going to new exotic fields, and you will see the, v the VC industry, the venture capital industry, and the finance going to those uh, new places and new trends. Another thing that we, that we believe that will change dramatically in the coming decade is the involvement of the Israeli economy and government uh, with the high-tech sector. Today, uh, we are working very hard uh, and have already successes in joining with our government partners, uh, other ministries, to support implementation of technologies in the Israeli industries and in the Israeli market and health organization. We are working very hard with the regulators to create a regulatory environment that will enable sandboxes, will enable test beds, better sites, so we can actually let the startups go into the economy and get an advantage on their competitors globally because the economy will be more open for them. Uh, the last part I want to share some vision with you is regarding the, the financial aspect of, of the high-tech sector. Uh, in the last decade, and you can see the numbers here for the last uh, five years, we have seen a, a huge movement towards late stage and growth investment within, within the high-tech sector. Uh, the numbers are growing in more than 20% year over year. Uh, and huge amounts of money that is created you know, Israeli unicorns, who have heard of that uh, uh, 10 years ago. Private companies that worth more than $1 billion. Uh, we see this huge investment. We still see a market failure in the debt market, but we see that also as a, as a huge potential. Because 
if we will open the debt market, and that's what we're doing these days, we will be able to, le to leverage the equity investment, to make the equity much more efficient, to bring more equity investment and then more debt investment, and let the industry scale globally, uh, both in organic growth and also in unorganic growth, meaning acquiring high-tech companies from all over the world and creating large multinational high-tech companies coming from Israel. So that's our vision, or some of our vision, uh, for the next decade. I hope you were inspired by the last 50 years because we are not stopping. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Sagi. And now I would like to, uh, to welcome Bella Abrams, Director of Corporate Affairs and Public Affairs at Intel. Please come. Thank you. Thank you, Lital, and good afternoon, everyone. About two months ago, I visited the ancient city of Machu Picchu. Uh, I've discovered an amazing and inspiring city. And actually, it made me think about the Inca, who were the first startup nation for the world for about 400 years. They had amazing architects who built structures. They have scientists who develop technology. They had artists. They had agriculture experts that actually developed a lot of vegetables and fruits that we are eating today. So a lot of the things, a lot of the things uh, that the Inca created are still existing today, but not much of the society uh, stayed, unfortunately. The empire was crumbled, the jungle covered Machu Picchu, and the city was lost for centuries. And I think they had a talent, they had innovation, but still something was missing. What was missing? And in other words, I want to ask, what is the thing that we need to pay attention to in order not to have the same ending for our story of startup nation. So with your permission, I want, I want to move forward, to, to run forward few centuries and to come to those days. So I want to talk a minute about Intel. Intel in Israel exists from 1974. Uh, we started with five pioneers working in a tiny uh, apartment in Haifa, and now we are 14 1,000 employees, 14,000 employees in Israel that are responsible for $6 billion export. This is 1% of the Israeli GDP, and it means a lot of responsibility. Um, and what make companies like Intel to expand their presence in Israel for more than 50 years, or for almost 50 years? I think there are many reasons. And there are three reasons that I want to discuss uh, now. The first is the governments and economy. The second is the talent. And the third is the innovative ecosystem. So let's start with the, the governments and economy. It's not a secret that uh, companies are making decisions based on economic and financial criteria and this is it. They are looking for uh, the way how easy it is to make businesses in the country, supportive, supportive regulation, as Sagi just mentioned. And, uh, and also the, the financial things are uh, really, really important because government across the whole, uh, the whole world are just uh, providing and uh, asking companies to come and, uh, pre and invest there with some uh, incentive packages. And they know that the ROI, the return of investment for those incentives is very, very high and very positive, and it's coming back to the country. So this is one, one, uh, one thing. Now let's talk about the human capital or talent as we like to call it. In Intel, we're saying that everything starts from sand. This is what silicon is made of. 
And all the rest is the human capital or the talent added value on the send. So the human capital are critical in decisions companies made on locations where to grow and where to invest. And in Israel, we are missing, in the high-tech ecosystem, we are missing 15,000 engineers. That's like a magic number. And it's not, the whole story is not only quantity, but also quality. So it's not only the education and the deep knowledge that they're acquiring, it is also about the broader skills that are adapted and aligned with the needs of the uh, future working place. So we need to align all our education systems from kindergarten till after the academia just to have those needed skilled graduates that have both the deep and the broad capabilities. So this is the talent. And the third reason that MNCs are here to stay is the in innovative ecosystem. We have the army, we have the culture, we have the academia, and we have the, the combination of the whole ecosystem. In the military service, our young people are dealing with challenges that nobody in their age is dealing with. And they're coming out from the uh, this service as a responsible, mature, and creative adults. And after that, the academia, which has an di ongoing dialogue and listen to the ecosystem, prepare the needed graduate for the current and the future working place. Uh, we can, the, the combination of our ecosystem, having MNCs like Intel, having startup team, that we have the, the high, high, high uh, number, of, or one of the highest in the world, and traditional industry, all this interactions are creating growth and uh, innovation. And you probably know, but if not, Israel was ranked by Bloomberg as the sixth in the world in innovation. And this is very, very high place. And of course, we cannot, and uh, my friend will talk about that, but we cannot talk, uh, ignore the Israeli uh, characteristic. And it's a very diverse society. And uh, also we have the tendency to challenge the status quo, to uh, not to ask always for permission, to have a little bit chutzpah. So that's also part of the innovation uh, ecosystem. So I want to summarize. The three main reasons MNCs are here to stay are the governance and economy, talent, and innovative ecosystem. And this is exactly why I think that our startup nation will not become a lost city of like Machu Picchu. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Bella, so much. So now I would like to ask to the stage Daphne, Professor Daphna Kariv, international expert in entrepreneurship and from the Monopolis Academic Center. Thank you. Okay, so good afternoon. So this is it, right? Sorry. Technical things. Okay. Okay, so again, good afternoon. We all want to predict the future, and um, we all are convinced that by predicting the future, we need to look at startups. Startups are those that bring innovation, fresh mindsets, new technologies, um, new products. Car startups are actually the carters of the future. And interestingly, the responsibility and the load for nurturing and growing startups, successful startups, is, is assigned to the academia and to the education. 
It is designed because education would be the bridging chain between data, research, um, any kind of equipment, any kind of uh, techniques, and the know-how. Since uh, academia provides the uh, platform for labs, for experts, for educators. And academia is also perceived to be the body that scouts for the innovation. So when the next startup comes with, arises with a new idea, then the academia and the education would be those that know exactly how to teach and how to lead the startup towards success. But startups are not uh, standalone and they are part, they are very primarily actors at the ecosystem. They are also the ones that are perceived to be the, uh, the, the main contributor for disseminating value, disseminating impact. But they have to be uh, perceived and they have to be addressed while looking at the whole ecosystem. And actually, this is exactly the reason or the impetus for many entrepreneurship developers and uh, educators to start to find new forms of education for startups. And you can see here a list of different types of uh, education forms for entrepreneurs, which are different in their vision, in their technologies, in their techniques, in their uh, strategies, and also uh, different in their actors. So you see accelerators, incubators, open innovation platforms, builders, labs, you see mentors, you see coaches, trainers, all are aiming to pave the way for startups uh, to be able to generate the assets needed and required to be successful. But still we see that uh, these forms of education are not specifically assigned to the academia only. And we see now startups embraced by, by many actors, many actors that might be government officers, that might be uh, serial entrepreneurs, that might be uh, people, representative leading people from the corporate and many other. Because startups expect, and the ecosystem expects, um, the combination between theory and practice, between a general information and the vertical information, the pro professional one, uh, between the uh, cognitive approach or the research approach and the affective approach, the one that is more personalized. So the combination between the whole ecosystem, the stakeholders of all ecosystem and the academia and the education is really needed and really expected. And the value of such combination is not only by looking at startups' involvement in different types of specialties and expertise coming from the different actors, but also the engagement. So the engagement for the startups' performance and involvement and success would be of all the ecosystem altogether. Um, and it's interesting to see, for example, if you look here at the advantages or the components that uh, education used to provide to startups, we see now interesting combinations of governments uh, that might be, for example, the one that are in charge of, for example, um, uh, open, uh, open startups to diversity. Research or academia would be more responsible for research and multidisciplinarity. Uh, the media could take a role. Uh, serial entrepreneurs might be, or CEOs, might be the one that could uh, help and support uh, for smart um, networking and so forth. On a personal note, um, I started seven years ago an incubator at the academia. Uh, if you, some of you probably know Paybox. Uh, so they were incubated in our incubator. And then when uh, we figured out how the ecosystem uh, works and acts, so we evolved it into an accelerator. 
And then uh, we had other uh, businesses coming from the accelerator, and the vision was different, and the strategies were different. Now we are working on an OIP, on an open innovation platform, so we work very closely with the corporate. So we see that the same uh, approach and the same strategy, which is education, evolves and becomes something that is much more aligned to the expectation of the startups, of the ecosystem, and of the academia. So to summarize it, we are all gathered here and we are all representing different actors, different stakeholders, different people, bodies of the ecosystem. And we should join forces and we should work together in order not only to support the startups, but also to shape a better future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daphna. And now I would like to present Inbal Ariely, author, serial entrepreneur, tech influencer, and co-CEO of Synthesis to talk about the sociological aspect. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon to everyone. Um, and I guess I'm the only one standing between you and your next ses session. Um, so I'll try to inspire you by, by the, giving you some closing remarks for this uh, very interesting uh, panel here. And we'll talk a little bit about the um, sociological aspects of Startup Nation and the future of Startup Nation, um, but also about the world. Because many of you are actually not coming from Israel, right? Um, and what's happening here in Israel is definitely of interest to you, uh, but you also have your home countries. So I want you to take a look for a second on this um, list of skills that the World Economic Forum is actually um, looking at and studying. And looking at them, trying to understand how will the future look like? And what will be the skills anywhere in the world, anywhere you can imagine, that people would need to foster and practice and, and actually hold. Most of these, by the way, are very difficult to um, learn, right? Just by um, pure academic classes. Most of these are skills that are needed to be trained and experienced. Just take a second or 10 seconds um, and you'll see that some of the skills are about people and themselves. So skills that you possess within yourself, such as creative thinking and questioning and critical thinking. And others are skills that you actually possess which relate to others, such as um, leadership skills. And then another layer of skills is one which relates to yourself and the world. For example, your, your capability to deal with a constantly changing environment or ambiguity. Now this is a study which I really um, suggest following and reading as the World Economic Forum keeps updating that list of skills for the future. But how is that connected to Israel, right? So when we talk about all these um, great statistics and accomplishments that you've heard about the Israeli startup nation and its really flourishing, successful position in the world, the main reason which is given as a catalyst for that um, as being the differentiator or the cradle for innovation is the military. And units such as 8200 and other units within the Israeli military are actually being looked at from outside of Israel trying to understand the secret. What's the secret that's happening in the Israeli military and how come in such a relative short period of time, you said 50 years, right? We've been capable of creating these accomplishments. I myself am a 8200 alum um, very active also in the alumni organization of 8200. I started Israel's first startup accelerator exactly 10 years ago on behalf of the 8200 Alumni Association. However, I don't think that's where it starts. And I actually think it starts more at this age. So um, the same person, some say the same height, uh, with a difference of about uh, 40 years in between. And this picture was taken at my home where, where I was born. Um, I, I like to joke and say that I was born and raised on a homus and chutzpah here in Israel. Um, I was born in the um, south city of Beersheba. How many of you have visited Beersheba? 
Okay, so we have a fair share of people that have seen Be'er Sheva. Uh, when I grew up in Be'er Sheva in the south of Israel some 40 years ago, um, it had the university, it had the hospital, it had uh, um, a lot going on in the city, but it was not the cyber capital of Israel back then. It was just the capital of the Negev. And, um, you know, it was this yellowish, deserty um, city in Israel. At the age of four, my family um, relocated to Switzerland. And um, I experienced a completely different landscape. And I want to take you to, with me to a journey into one anecdote of my childhood, which I think will explain um, how I think part of the discovery of Israel today and innovation in Israel is actually not about looking into or finding new landscapes, but actually looking at existing ones with a fresh set of eyes. So let me briefly take you to this image, which I'm sure everyone here shares. You all know what this is, right? You've all experienced that as a kid. So at the age of four, I arrived to the International School of Geneva, where the teacher takes me by the hand. I speak only Hebrew, I don't speak French, I don't speak English. And she shows me, she orients me. She was very welcoming. welcoming. And she takes me by the hand and she takes me to the playground and there's a kid in front of me and she does like this. And I pause, and then she smiles at me, and I understand it's my turn to go up the ladder, climb the ladder. She, she does like this again. I pause. The kid in front of me goes down the ladder. She smiles at me. I understand it's my turn. I go. I slide on the slide, and there's a rhythm to it. It's predictable. It's fun. It's a very positive experience. Sounds familiar? Makes sense. I became obsessed in the recent years in my research for the book about playgrounds around the world. Take a look at this image taken at a Croatian playground. Um, but you can find similar signs everywhere in the world. And, and for those who are um, sharp in their sightseeing, they will see the middle uh, bottom image of a kid which is not supposed to do something. I'm not sure what, by the way. Either go like upside down or maybe climb. But they're definitely not allowed to do that. Now, welcome to an Israeli playground. So four o'clock in the afternoon, kids get out of the uh, um, um, kindergartens of, of schools, of after-school activities. And what you see here is a completely different experience than the one I had in the International School of Geneva. Now let's assume for a second um, that Israeli kids are not smarter than other kids around the world. Right? At the age of four, there's no reason that they would be smarter. There, there's no difference. They're not more creative. But what's happening is that actually the environment reacts completely different to what they do. And at a typical Israeli playground, at, the, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, there is big balagan. There's a lot of chaos. A lot of things are happening. There's not one way or best practice to go up the ladder and down the slide. Everything is okay. And kids from a very, very young age, as young as four, start to practice these soft skills of dealing with uncertainty because they actually are not sure that the process is up the ladder, down the slide. They learn to negotiate, to actually solve confrontations because one kid is coming up and the other wants to go down and now they need to solve the problem. They're more creative and they train all these skills while the environment lets them, lets them do that. Now, statistically, are there more injuries in Israeli playgrounds? than in other places in the world? No. The kids just learn how to cope with that situation. When you look at the Israeli childhood journey, you can actually see how these soft skills that we saw at the beginning, okay, that skills of the, the list of skills for the future published by the World Economic Forum is actually one which is fostered here in Israel from a very young age throughout the Israeli childhood, definitely also in the Israeli military, and even after the military, at the big military trip that we all do in, in, in uh, um, South America and other places. Um, but if you think, actually, about these soft skills, they're not necessarily required to be fostered at a young age. They can be trained. Think of them like muscles that we all possess all over the world. These skills are inherited in every one of us. And it's now just, <clears throat> just a matter of practice of awareness and practice and training, and they can definitely be um, trained. So my encouragement 
to you would be going back home, would be to think of these skills and how you can start training them and practicing them. In Israel, I think we're lucky. Um, they're fostered and nurtured from a very young age throughout our childhood, and they definitely represent the future of economies around the world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So I think that we have a few minutes for questions from the audience. So who would like to go first? You have to ask questions. Yeah, come on. You must have questions after this, this kind of exciting panel. OK, you, thank you. Chutzpah. About chutzpah. So uh, normally, I used to, because I learned this word from the book Startup Nation. But then I realized, when I, after I moved to Israel, I realized this word, when it's used in the local, by the locals, it mostly has a negative connotation. So, I mean, how to deal with the, the negativity? Sure. So, of course, um, chutzpah in Hebrew, or chutzpah, is actually more used as a negative term, as um, impoliteness, right? Um, <clears throat> like anything in life, I guess it's all a matter of balance. Um, that same impoliteness, in a way, can be translated into daring and, and having audacity and some grit and um, braveness to do things that are unexpected and out of your comfort zone. Um, now, it's not about um, saying that everything should have just chutzpah, okay? Don't forget, it's just the title of a book. There's much more to it. So it just encompasses and, and encapsulates the concept of having an open-minded, creative, brave, if you want, um, approach and mindset towards things you do. Yeah? Saki, <laughs> so, I wanted to ask you if the Israel Innovation Authority has anything similar to it around the world? And if not, are other countries looking to the Israel Innovation Authority as a model to start? Well, you know, as, as a government or a government agency, uh, our life is not always that different from the private sector. We're at, at a continuous competition. So the answer is yes. Uh, we have some very uh, good counterparts, very professional ones, you know, starting from countries like uh, Denmark, New Zealand, Sweden, Finland. Uh, we are learning from them, they are learning from us. Uh, our goal is at the end to be uh, better in the results. In the processes, uh, policy can be very similar you know, in, in the strategy. But the way you implement it to Israelis, you know, that's part of the, part of the charm. Uh, but yes, we are in competition, but not only us as, as an innovation authority, but the entire, the entire high-tech and startup community. But we, we love competition. I mean, that's what makes us in fit, right? Um, I heard uh, you mentioning, and mainly uh, the Intel Bella representative, about the competitiveness and the lack of the shortage of, of human capital. Is there any recommendation or thing that we, all of you or some of you are doing in order to uh, maintain our comp competitiveness and our future growth and talents? Uh, I can say something and then uh, you can add. Uh, I, I have two recommendations. One, I think that for talent and to be prepared for the uh, future working environment, we need a long-term strategic uh, uh, planning. And this is like the state or the country, uh, one of the challenges uh, to have like a, uh, a long-term. And the second, I think that the multi-sectorial collaboration is needed. I don't think that one of the sectors can move the needles by itself. So this is, th those are my two recommendations. Anyone wants to add? Let's have the academia lenses. So uh, I would say that uh, multidisciplinarity is very important for that. 
Uh, the academia, it's like a roller coaster, even though it's academia, since it started by having everything very segmented. So you had uh, computer sciences, and then you had the uh, social sciences, and so forth. And now we are looking at um, aggregating things together to combining and to trying to figure out what makes it rational. Otherwise, it's a balagan, okay? So we need to be prepared for this. But this would uh, enable the students and the alumni to be much more prepared and much more um, comprehensive in terms of uh, what is needed and how they can adapt themselves, even pivot some time when they are already uh, at, the, at the cooperation. So this would be my recommendation. So I'll add something from a demographic um, point of view. Um, Israel is a very diversified country, right? We have more than 70 nationalities represented here. It has always been one of the advantages of the entrepreneurial mindset. But when you look at the tech ecosystem, there are actually four groups that are underrepresented. Women, ultra-Orthodox, Israeli Arabs, and people over the age of 45. These four groups, by the way, women and, and people over the age of 45 are two groups that are also underrepresented in other hubs of entrepreneurship around the world, not just in Israel, but it's definitely the situation here. Now, um, necessity in Israel, uh, political necessity is such that we don't immediately open ourselves with visas to the world, importing talent, which actually becomes, in a way, an opportunity. Because that challenge that we have now of that shortage of, of, of positions, of people, we actually, we have no other choice but to fill it. And addressing these four groups, which the government is doing, and multinationals are doing, and the ecosystem itself, the startups are doing, um, will actually solve that program through a variety of programs that already exist to bring in that talent into the tech ecosystem. Exactly, and would I add also at the Paris Center, this is one of our aims, to bring you know, diversity, to inclusion to this great ecosystem by including those uh, uh, populations that just mentioned. Yeah, ju okay. just two, two comments. Uh, one, we are mostly lacking uh, R&D personnel. And as we see companies grow and become multinational Israeli companies headquartered in Israel, we have much more employment that is non-R&D. So that's uh, one thing. Uh, Another thing, just a comment, do you know how much time it takes to get uh, an expert visa for a high-tech company in Israel? I assume it's very short with a new program. <laughs> Give me a guess. Uh, three weeks. Six days, number one Yay, in the world. Wow. Yeah, that, that deserves a clap, exactly, yeah. <laughs> okay, everybody, so we need to uh, finish this great session. A uh, big thank you to all our speakers and to our crowd for this amazing stage. I will finish this session with another quote by Shimon Peres. You know, he used to say that his biggest regret, regret was that his dream wasn't big enough. So he dared us always to dream bigger, and this became our motto. So you can see the dream big outside of the Paris Center. So I invite you to dream big with us and to help us shape, you know, the next decade of the Israeli startup nation. Thank you so much.